first of all, I'm going to ask some questions. How many people here have dove Truck Lagoon? Awesome. Okay, how many people here have heard of Truck Lagoon? Not bad. How many people here know where Truck Lagoon is? Hey, okay. it's going to make it easy. Actually, that will kill my first slide. I don't need it. Uh, in any case, Truck Lagoon is pretty much in the middle of nowhere. It's right there's some specks there, and it's one of those specks. It's just north of the equator, and uh, this is the tide to North Carolina. It's part of the Caroline Islands. So I had to stretch it to, to make it appropriate for the graveyard of the Atlantic. But uh, in any case, it was originally called Chuuk, and uh, then Truck, and now it's back to Chuuk again. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. And it is an atoll, and as you can see, it's, it's actually a, an extinct volcano that comes off the bottom of the ocean. And the islands are in the cauldron of the volcano. The reef is the rim of the volcano. And there's several openings through, so in a few places, ships can get in and get out. And, uh, and then there's a series of islands inside. Oh, I should back up here. I forgot to mention that. It, uh, no one really knows when it was initially settled, but in the 1500s, I think, yeah, um, the Spanish discovered it. Oh, and it is 40 miles in diameter. Uh, and then in the late 1800s, Spain, or excuse me, Germany purchased it from Spain. So you know how you sell a country. And that happened to them a lot. And then the Spanish named it Truck. So that's where it got its name, Truck. Okay, at the end of World War I, if you remember, Japan was actually an ally in World War I. So as a spoil of war, the ownership of the islands went from Japan to Germany. So now it became under the control and owned by Germany. And even though they weren't supposed to do it, Japan built a military base there. And it actually ended up being the second largest Japanese naval base in World War II. Number one was Tokyo. On February 4th, 1944, uh, we had reached, yeah, MacArthur was coming back to take the Philippines back. And we were capturing islands as we went, you know, driving the Japanese off. And we got to the Solomons. Uh, one, the Solomons were only a thousand miles from truck, and two, we had planes at that point that could actually fly 2,000 miles round trip. So knew, no one knew what was happening at these islands, you know, as far as the Allies. So we sent two planes there to photograph, strictly a photo reconnaissance mission, and it was 2,000 mile round trip, and they took photos. And uh, the photos revealed this huge naval base. And the islands were super well fortified. There were all kinds of gun emplacements and guns in mountains and pillboxes. It was super well fortified. But also, the majority of the Japanese fleet was actually in truck. Submarines, aircraft carriers, destroyers, battleships was just loaded with warships. <coughs> Unfortunately, the planes were spotted by the Japanese and fired upon, but not hit. So the planes made it back with their, their film. So we now knew what was there, but the Japanese also knew that we knew. So they immediately got all the capital ships out, all the warships out of the harbor and sent them to sea because they figured at some point we're going to be attacking. But all the supply vessels were still there. In fact, they really didn't even alert the supply vessels until after all the warships were out, because that was their priority. And uh, there were a couple, there were a couple destroyers still there that were disabled. They were being repaired, but uh, everything else were basically supply vessels. And uh, here are some of the recon photos. But because it was so well fortified, MacArthur and the other officer or generals determined that there's no way this island could be taken without a huge loss of life. So instead of capturing the island, it was determined we'll neutralize it. 
and to put it bluntly, neutralize meant bombing the crap out of it. So on February 17th and 18th, which is approximately two weeks after we got the photos, uh, the uh, Operation Hailstone began, and it was the Task Force 58. There were 10 aircraft carriers involved, six battleships, 10 cruisers, and 500 aircraft. Okay, so in two weeks' time, we got them within range to attack. And the, the initial attack took place over two days, nonstop, 24 hours a day, just different, different waves of planes. It was all done by plane. And uh, there were, th yeah, 30 waves of attacking planes, and we hit the shore facilities, we hit the runways, airplanes on the ground, airplanes in the sky that they did get off, and obviously the ships. The historic raid on the Jap Pearl Harbor writes finish to Truk as a mid-Pacific enemy base, a crushing defeat so successful that high-ranking Jap officers are ousted by the Nippon High Command. This is actual footage from one of the planes during the attack. The Truk Lagoon, cluttered with bombed and battered hooks, is in itself full proof that never again can the Jap Navy ride at anchor here in safety. Order is heard, return to carriers. Just average American boys taught to fly, taught to fight, taught to win. One wheel missing, but it's a perfect landing. <laughs> One wheel missing, but a perfect landing. Okay, so the attack itself was actually 15 times more powerful than the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. To give you an idea of the, how hard we hit them. <coughs> and. Uh, there were 45 ships sunk, 265 aircraft, Japanese aircraft destroyed. We did have losses. We had uh, planes shot down outside of the harbor. We had planes shot down inside the harbor. The planes that were shot down outside of the harbor, we had submarines out there that picked up the survivors. And then we also had uh, aircraft that picked up survivors outside of the harbor or the lagoon and then also within. And if they picked them up inside, they took them out, landed, subs came up, and then they transferred the, our pilots to the sub. So many of our pilots that were shot down were recovered. Those that not were captured, not one single one made it out alive. Every, every single American pilot that was shot down during the attack in multiple ways was killed. We'll hit a little bit of that later. One thing that's interesting, anybody hear of Pappy Boington, Baba Black Sheep? He was captured earlier in some other island. He was being transported to Japan. The plane that he was on landed in truck because he was going to be held there for a short time before he was flown to Japan. The plane landed during the attack. He was actually on, in truck during our attack in truck and survived, which I think that's pretty wild. Yeah, the aftermath of the attack, first of all, we didn't stop with just the initial attack. We kept them neutralized. So literally, every couple few days, whatever, we'd bomb the airstrips again, we'd bomb any ships that were coming in. So the islands, were, the group of islands were totally cut off. No food was getting in, no personnel, no resources. I think one submarine did make it in with some supplies. Uh, but basically, the, the Japanese were starving, and the locals, the truckies, many of them starved to death. In fact, it's, I, I read one place that there's virtually no family that didn't have relatives that starved to death during, during this period. So it's pretty brutal. So after the uh, Japanese surrendered, truck became a possession of the United States. They became, a, I guess, a protectorate under our control. And, uh, 129 Japanese were, that were on truck were tried for war, war crimes, many in prison, and I think it's, yeah, 12 were convicted of serious stuff and executed. And there was some very nasty stuff that took place to our pilots. 
Okay, so 1978, basically we gave them their independence and they became part of the uh, Mic state of Micronesia, which is a group of different islands around the Pacific. And they chose to rename themselves their original name before you know, the Spanish bought them, uh, or no, before the Spanish captured them, I should say. And uh, so they went back to the name of Chuck, or, or Chuk, excuse me. Okay, so 74 years later, here we are in the Guam airport. Uh, I would say after 20 hours in the air flying, and eight hours of layovers, and we still had this layover, and then another three hour flight. Basically, the only way to get there is to go through Guam. Actually, there is another puddle jumper, but it's really brutal. We, we did it on our first trip coming back. Uh, but, and the only airline that goes in, at least major, is United Airlines, which Continental Airline was who went there originally. In fact, that's how diving started there. Two Continental Airline pilots actually dove there and said, whoa, this is pretty cool. And the locals, didn't make, it didn't make any sense. It's just a bunch of rusted metal. But uh, that's really what sort of started it. Okay, remember I spoke about the, the reef. And right out here, actually I labeled it, you can see the, the reef at the rim that goes all the way around. And then these are unha uninhabited islands here. But later, you can see some, you can see some buildings along here. So the Chukis live on multiple islands. Now the main island is Moen, and that's where the, uh, the airstrip is, or the runway. It's a one mile runway, which was originally the Japanese runway that we bombed in World War II. And uh, it's only 737s that are flown in there. And they're modified with oversized tires, oversized brakes. Because basically when they come down, they got to stop quick. Because one ends the ocean, the other ends the ocean. So we had a group of, the second, I think the first trip we had 18 friends, and this one were like 22 or 23. Uh, most of us knew each other over the years. And the second trip was a fantastic group of people. We had a blast. But as you can see, we came with a little bit of gear. <laughs> Cameras. And no one brings tanks. They have the tanks. Except the rebreather, the closed circuit people did bring the rebreathers. Okay, so this is Blue Lagoon Resort. It was originally a, a Continental Hotel when Continental Airlines used to go there. And uh, Kimu, the guy that started the whole first dive operation there, just built a new dive shop next to the resort. And literally, I think before he opened, he found out that the resort was being sold. It was up for sale. And his son convinced him, now he was already in debt for the shop. His son convinced him to buy the resort. So that's how Blue Lagoon Dive Resort came about. And he's the guy that's the first commercial operation and, and most of us that go here consider it the best. Uh, there's liveaboard boats, but there's advantages and disadvantages. You can dive as much as you want with them. And most of the time, half the time, people were eating at our restaurant that are off the boats. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of fun. But it's a beautiful place. I should mention, if you don't dive, there's no reason to go to truck or chew. <laughs> there is nothing, and I mean nothing, of interest there. You don't go shopping. You know, Penny did get a dress there, which you'll see in a picture in the local store at the shop, which is a steel building and that's just has food and clothing for the locals. You know, there's just nothing there to do. There's no beaches because it's rocky, uh, it's diving. And uh, the resort, I think it goes back to the 60s, I'm not sure, but it's old, but it's very clean, very comfortable. They literally sweep the lawn. The, yeah, income there, the minimum wage is $2 an hour and it's 80% on employment. But nobody goes hungry because the Chukis take care of each other. Those that have money take care of the other families that don't have money. So it's a, a very cooperative type society. Okay, this is uh, where Blue Lagoon is, is actually where the amphibious air base was. And it's one of the areas we bombed the crap out of. And later, 
the, the resort was built there, but these are, that's a pillbox that's right outside our bedroom window. You know, they're all over the place. And this is our room. Getting there is expensive, that's the problem. It's a long way to get there and it's an expensive flight. And because I'm 6'4", Penny and I get extended legroom seats. So to get six inches of extra legroom, it costs us thousand dollars more. You know, but I need that legroom for those long flights. Uh, once you're there, I think the last trip it was up to $155 a day, uh, a piece. That's for the room with water view, two queen size beds, which gives one place to put camera gear. Um, it doesn't include food, but it includes two dives a day with tanks, with weight belts. And I think if you do extra dives, it's $35 more. So it's, you know, it's cheaper to stay in a hotel, the hotel there and to dive there than it is to go out on a boat here. You know, it's, it's less expensive. And you can't believe what the mates do. In fact, you'll see. This is the dive shop uh, at the resort. There's nothing there to buy other than t-shirts. You know, you don't go there to buy equipment. They do have rental equipment, so people that don't fly their stuff there, you can rent a regulator and so on. And uh, this is the, the full operation. And if you notice what this guy is sitting on, anybody have an idea what that is? It's a recompression chamber. And actually, does anybody know the name Al Giddings? He was a famous underwater photographer years ago. Al Giddings spent time in that recompression chamber. Uh, they actually love John McCain on Chuk. And the reason is he and his wife were there. I think she was doing some volunteer work at the hospital and they also were divers. And basically he saw this recompression chamber. And I think three months after they left, a brand new state-of-the-art recompression chamber showed up which actually two of our friends now spent time in that recompression chamber. Uh, so thank God they didn't have to do it in this. Okay, the operation is amazing. They have, you know, like I dove doubles, because they do some long dives. And I, when I have a camera, I breathe more than I normally do. And uh, so they just, isolation manifold, they just throw a set of doubles together Penny dove, I think, a single hundred. Uh, they have three or four compressors. They have a couple oxygen generators. They have helium. So, uh, and they also have a separate closed circuit rebreather, you know, rebreather room so people can service and work on the rebreathers uh, as well. The, the desk, it, I'm not a rebreather person, but the, the Whatever you pack it with, you have to order in advance and have shipped there. They don't keep that in inventory. The food you pay for, but it's very inexpensive. And the menu what, is at least 20 some odd pages long. I have no idea how they can do that much stuff. And to give an idea, there's fresh tuna. And I think that was $9 for a dozen pieces of fresh tuna and the rice. So they don't rip you off. Sounds like a sales promo. Right? Uh, of course, the most important part, the tiki bar. And this is the view from the tiki bar. Notice the uh, propeller here with the bullet holes through it. I thought that was fun. That's where we usually sit for sunset. Okay, the boats are six people per boat, uh, twin 40 horsepower Johnsons with tillers. So the guy that runs the boat has a tiller in each hand and runs for maybe 40 minutes that way, or 45 minutes if you're doing, or maybe even an hour if you're doing something way out. And uh, actually very comfortable, plenty of room. Uh, there's the operator, in this case it's our friend Deer, and the guide is uh, Kieran, and that's, that's Kieran. And uh, he's 60 something then I think now? 66. Yeah, 66 years old. There's no markers, but they do have moorings 20 feet under. So he'll go along and he'll motion the boat, go left or right. He'll spot them, the buoy, and he just, no fins. He just jumps off the bow of the boat, swims down 20 feet, 
loops the line under, comes up, and then presses himself over the bow and climbs in the boat, which I don't think I could ever do that, even when I was young. And if you don't use a guide, you're stupid because you'll miss so much. I mean, you can do your own thing, but the guides know where everything is and you get the most efficient dive with a guide. So in any case, we'll first look at the Fujikawa, which is actually the very first wreck we went to. And uh, most of them are transports. Shallowest depth, only 30 feet, deepest 115. A lot of people think the truck is all deep and the deepest is about 200 feet. There's a lot of wrecks there that total recreational, no problem. Uh, now we did a huge amount of decompression diving because it gives you a lot more time and we do penetrations. So to give you an idea, and actually both times we were there, we had lots of rain, so there was runoff. So the water, and the, not the deep, if we were deep wrecks, it was clear. The less deep, it was a little murky, but this is what murky looks like. <laughs> and this was so cool. I mean, this is our first dive there and you swim in into the wreck and right there is a wing of a Japanese zero which was cargo that was being shipped there. Well, there were a bunch of them in there. And I'll tell you this, you look at, the, this is where the pilot sat, obviously. That skin is like, what, almost paper thin. They had no protection whatsoever. Absolutely no protection. Yeah, there you can see it a little bit. But what they did is they shipped the planes there, typically somewhat disassembled, then they'd offload, then they'd reassemble them. So engines might be here, propellers here, fuselage, there's a propeller. And this is a cowl from one of the bigger planes, which we didn't see any big planes inside any of the cargo holds. And those are, I think they're called stick grenades, if I'm not mistaken, it's sort of like what the Germans used in World War II. Okay, and this is torpedo, you know, the front end of it, back here, right here is where the propeller is. Okay, and this is the bow of the Fujikawa. Oh, by the way, maru sort of means loop. And all of the, the transport vessels were marus. So everything's a maru, except for the destroyers. And this is a, an auxiliary telegraph here, and you see the deck gun back there. And on that deck gun, of course this has been cleaned off, but it's 1899. That deck gun actually came from a British warship from the late 1800s that they just repurposed and put onto a, a transport vessel. That's Penny from behind. This was cool. This, once they really knew us and felt comfortable with us, we, we ended up doing a lot deeper penetration. And this is an easier wreck to do, but this is so cool. This is actually the machine shop next to the engine room of the ship. And these boxes are filled with you know, materials. It's actually, for me, the photography here was brutal because it was stirred up. I think the, uh, one of the other liveaboard boats had been here, so it was, and they tend to muck things up pretty bad. Uh, so it's hard to get decent photos in here without backscatter. But I did get a few. I've seen pictures that people got in when no one else was, and it's really cool. You can get great pictures. But uh, these are for different types of lubricants that they dispensed. Uh, yeah, vices, one here, one here. A metal lathe. <coughs> you can see the scatter. This I just loved and somehow I was able to get a decent photo. This is like a phone booth. And it's in the engine room, or it's in the machine shop actually, next to the engine room. And uh, my guess is that they used it to communicate, go in there to deaden the sound so they could communicate better without all, you know, with all the noise going on. And of course, cage light, gauges, and right there, oops, did I go back? Oh, there we go. 
Yeah, right here is the telephone, you know, hanging there. Not in very good condition. Okay, next the Nepo. And see, shallowest 80 feet. <coughs> see, these wrecks are all intact, either sitting upright or on their side. And within the lagoon, there's no current, so that helps the preservation of the wrecks. The water temperature is a constant 82 degrees, I think plus or minus one degree. Uh, because it's a closed lagoon, the oxygen level is low in the water, and that helps preserve the wrecks. And they don't have wave action. Like when we first got there, it was blowing over 30 knots. I thought, There's, we're not gonna go out. Looked out the window and it was nothing but white water. We went, you know, because in 30 knot winds, maybe it was an 18 inch chop. So they never get big wave action. So there's very little to damage the wrecks. Here, I don't care if no one ever dove a wreck here, they're gonna be destroyed. They're falling apart on their own. You know, just from the ocean action and the, uh, obviously the salt environment. Okay, so in any case, on the depot, the chalice points to the top of the bridge and there's inside the bridge and right here was the helm and that was the ship's wheel, that's the metal band, the wood is disintegrated. And uh, the telegraph right there. And these, at first I thought they were periscopes, but they didn't seem right. And actually what they were were range finders for the large guns ashore. They determined the distance to a target. You know, like if there's a, a ship offshore, they could determine the range to set the gun for the distance to drop it. And a howitzer, it's cargo on the deck. Another angle. This thing's responding a little slow, but these are huge files. What this is, is an anti-aircraft gun. Here's one barrel, twin barrels, one here, one here. This is the base, it's laying sort of like on its back. I guess when, when the bombs hit or whatever, just Knocked it, knocked it off its stand. So this is the base, part of the base, and then the, the two barrels. And I believe this is a two-man tank. And the, the gun's not on this tank yet. They didn't assemble it completely. I'm a little rocky on my video. It's sort of fun, though, seeing a tank sitting on the bow of a ship. It's pretty wild. And again, this one's not real deep. And just a shot of the tank. And there's another anti-aircraft <coughs> gun. You can see the barrel, barrel right here. And decompression on some of these wrecks is like nothing. Because basically what you do is the masts are intact. You swim up the mast. And the mast is like a coral reef. It's just covered with life. So well, first of all, sometimes we were into maybe 50 minutes or 40 minutes into a decompression when we're down inside the wreck. But then you start working different decks. You get higher and higher. Your decompression time starts to drop. You get out. You go up the mast. By the time you get to the top, you might have five minutes left. And there with no current and being with a guide, he knows which direction the boat is. I don't, but you swim underwater. You hold 15 feet and just swim and the next thing you know, it's time to surface and you're right there at the boat. Pretty cool. There we go. Yeah, you can see some of the life on the, on the mass. I mean, they're just covered with life. Okay, the Hokey. Uh, there is a story with this. The first year we dove there, we, we went with the same group on our boat both years, minus a couple people that changed. And uh, we're, we were called the fun boat because we were crazy. There was the TA boat and they were the rebreather people. TA standing for tight ass. <laughs> and actually the wife of one of the guys that was a TA was on our boat and she's the one that named them the TA boat. But, uh, in any case, uh, we knew we were going to go to the Hokie Maru, so 
the Chukis thought we were out of our minds because there we are standing on the boat doing the hokey pokey as we're leaving, singing the hokey pokey. So our guides at first didn't know what to think of it. The second time they knew and they just started laughing. But uh, this is the hokey when it was being, uh, it actually it was burning. And as you can see, it definitely took a, a major hit on the bow section. <clears throat> and this is what's neat about it. It's not a, it's an easy penetration. It's blown pretty well open. Uh, so you're really not in a totally closed environment like some of the things. But that's a, a steamroller, I think. And this video goes through a little bit here. Uh, but it's sort of fun. You'll, you'll start seeing some cool stuff in there. I should have cut this part out. There we go. The tractor. Sometimes you'll see uh, here, like somewhere in here, he goes like this to some of our other friends. He's not telling them to come. He's motioning to show them something that they're missing. I have to admit, with the camera, I tried to follow him because one, I'd be ahead of everybody else so the water wouldn't be stirred up to try to get some decent pictures. And two, you just saw a lot more if you paid attention. You can see how you can see blue sky out there, blue water out there, so the opening is really large. But what the Hokies known for are the trucks. They're just so cool. And what's amazing is you look at the tires, you almost think they could drive away. mesh that he's shining the light on. What that was used for is that there weren't roads necessarily, so they roll that mesh so vehicles could drive over soft ground without bogging down in the sand or whatever. So there's lots and lots of that there in the trucks. And the trucks typically, although there's a couple exceptions, typically didn't have any beds or anything on. What they would do is get them there and then build the frame for whatever they wanted the truck to do. But in here in a little bit, you'll see there is a, a low, low deck, uh, I don't know if that's the right term, but dump truck, a small dump truck. And later, in a little bit, I'm going to point something out to you. And it still blows my mind when I, looked, when I first saw it, when I saw it the second time, when I looked at my pictures, when I looked at the video, it just doesn't seem possible. And there's the dump truck. Yeah, the video will do a, a jump here where I switch to another segment. Because actually I videoed this whole dive. I, I didn't have any strobes or anything. I had two video lights. Uh, and somewhere along here I whacked the one, as in right there. And now it's not covering as well. This is soon through. Probably made it a little long, but this is, there we go. Okay, now start watching. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. And what you're going to see, see that? That's the back end of a steamroller, the roller part. You see that beam? You see right in underneath it, and up here is the front end. Nothing is touching anything except the middle of it at that angle. It's literally somehow balanced there. And guess where you don't swim? <laughs> See, there's a front end. I mean, it's like, it can't, everybody went, it can't be, it can't be. It is. Okay, the Kenshu, again, shallow is 40 feet. And deepest is only 131. Now, this one's one we, we did, uh, yeah, we did some a better penetration. Engine rooms were cool. This one had uh, diesel engines. Some of them had triple expansion steam engines which you know, normally we see sitting there wide open. On these things, they're multiple decks. 
So you see one part of the engine up here, and you go to another deck and another part, and you get down here, and that's where the crank is. Electrical panels. There we go. And that's inside an engine room. Some of them really had a lot of space. You do worry a bit about things collapsing. You know, a couple times you get a little nervous. And like JT says, there's always a, somebody on your shoulder when you're in total blackness, three decks down, even though you have, you're with some of the haze. One of the wrecks we were on uh, this trip a year ago, uh, I was behind Kieran. Oh, yeah, this is cool. These are wrenches. See how big they are? I think when I hit this one, yeah. That's a wrench. Oh, wow. They're huge. Uh, in any case, I was behind. We were outside a wreck. We were about to go into a, an opening. He got to it and just boom, stopped. A shiny light looked and looked and then backed off and went and started swimming away. So I had to look inside. All that was inside was metal. The week before, he was in there. A week later, it all collapsed inside. So these wrecks are deteriorating. Each year, we noticed from in a two year period of time, uh, from the first trip we did to the second, uh, some areas the bridges were collapsed where we were inside bridges before. This is a galley, you know, ceramic tile floor, the ovens, and the cooking tops. And bottles, I don't have that many pictures of bottles, but there were sake bottles and beer bottles. They definitely knew how to drink. And there's one of Penny's hard shots. Penny did that picture. And telegraph, okay, that's, a goal post, another nice decompression. Okay, Kayasumi. Okay, um, yeah, 39 feet, 115 feet. Now, typically, the longer we went into a trip, the deeper we started to go. Because again, the guys feel comfortable with you, and, and some of us maybe haven't dove for, let's say, from the end of the season until February, so it might be a five month period. This was sort of spooky. This one's laying on its side. And why there's oxygen bottles on it, I have no idea. Uh, but because it's laying on its side, those bottles are hanging in the air, which is sort of spooky, because you keep waiting for them to drop. And that's Penny's favorite panel, with the indicator lights on it. Yeah, the locals, the guides will wipe, so yeah. Yeah, just like on the deck gun, it was all shiny and yeah. The one thing they do that I don't like, and I try to avoid take, I don't even bother to take pictures, but then like Kieran pointing it out so you feel like you have to, is they stage stuff. You know, like outside the wreck for people that don't penetrate, they'll stage a bunch of bottles or pans or lights or, yeah, it's not the way it was. You know, so, uh, yeah, these are uh, ceramic, remember old ceramic fuses? That's what that is. Yeah, here's where it gets a little spooky. When you get down some of these staircases, and they look a little shaky and are a little shaky. This one, remember, this guy's on its side, but that's a bicycle right there. And I don't remember what those things are. It's like, it was just a neat area to swim through. <laughs> and you always feel good when you get outside into the blue open water, but it's so cool inside these wrecks. Shinkuku, that one's fun to say. And uh, sitting upright, intact. Bow. Now, because it's fairly shallow, if you notice the deck gun, that's a deck gun completely covered with corals and, and life. You can barely recognize it as a, a deck gun. We'll be on some deeper stuff in a few more slides and it'll have a totally different look because there's not as much growth. Here's Penny and that's the uh, a binnacle, the compass inside the bridge. 
the telegraph over there. Here. And there's the binnacle. At least the binnacle stands. I don't think the compass is still there. And that's evidently what he told us is a coffee maker. I guess it was plumbed. They just keep coffee on all the time, circulate hot water through. And lots of bathtubs, the Japanese style. Notice the silt. That's, that's your enemy. There is so much silt in these wrecks. It's amazing. There'll be some other shots that you can, like there in the, the bathroom. Yeah, Penny said, if I see one more urinal in a wreck, <laughs> she had it with urinals. Well, if you think of it, they drank a lot of beer. Okay, and this is actually a surgical room, and that was an operating table. Now, there are, as you can see, there are bones on the table. Again, that was done. Those bones were from in there, but they were down in the silt. So the, the locals laid them up so you know, they could be seen, just, just like the bottles. <coughs> Come on. There we go. Oh, anemones were gorgeous, and some of them literally were this big. They were huge, <coughs> and the bottom sides are very colorful. See, see, you don't have to go to a reef. You can wreck dive and have a reef. As I said, there's, there's our friend Brian and the an anemone closed up. And the, the purple is just gorgeous. And that sucker was big. You know, closed up, he was like this big. And I know Paul loves sharks. I think we saw one small shark. I have to realize this is a very poor area. <laughs> Where are the sharks? They eat them. There are no big fish. It's all small fish, because any big fish, they catch and they eat. They need it for food. Okay, the Rio, which was originally a passenger vessel, uh, again, converted to a transport. See, deepest depth, 115 feet. Yeah, it's laying on its side. That's a, that was one of my first Archie shots there. It's a, the propeller. One of our friends doing a video on it, and I just like the way the lighting caught it. And yeah, this one has a couple. Yeah, there you go. There's heading down the stairs and the different catwalks. That's one of my favorite shots inside the entering the engine room. And oh my God, gauges are gorgeous. <laughs> Telegraph repeaters, gauges. If you notice, this is a clock right here. And the clock, oops, I didn't zoom in. I will in a moment, I think. Yeah, there you go. It's, um, I think it's quarter to eight is when it stopped. And I, I did look research a little bit, and the ship sunk not at that time. So it was like, gee, I wonder why the times are different. And then our friend Brad Sheard went, well, they were mechanical clocks. They kept running. You know, they didn't stop running until they ran out. They ran underwater. I never thought of it. Like I said, some bottles, cases. Little bright. Yeah, that one you couldn't decompress on too well because it was horizontal. That's on the, uh, the Rio, which is laying sideways. And clam, the giant clams weren't real giant. They were about yay big. You know, they weren't like the monstrosities, but they were all over the masts and everything. <clears throat> Very colorful as well. Okay, Yamagiri. Yeah, I remember what's on the Yamagiri laying sideways. Actually, the first time we did this, we did a, I think this is the wreck. I may be lying, but. We did a real long penetration to get to see something that you'll see. In fact, it was a spooky penetration. It was through some areas that had caved in and you know, real tight squeezes. Yeah, that's an artillery. Well, they're all art big artillery shells that they were transporting. So that's what the big shore deck 
shore guns shot, you know, that they had up in the mountains and everything. And give you a little bit of an idea. And that's why we did the penetration. Uh, this poor guy didn't have a very good day. He's inside the engine room. There's two theories of why that skull is there. One, that, there, that he, you know, the explosion, he went up and the heat fused his skull to the metal. The other one, which I think is probably more probable, is the body eventually built up gases. He floated up, decomposed, and just the growth you know, grew around it. That skull is no longer there. Uh, there are Japanese volunteers that over the years, little by little, they're trying to recover the remains, of which there's you know, a huge number of remains on these wrecks still. Uh, so sometime in the past two or three years, they actually recovered this guy and actually the rest of parts of his body just down below, like his legs were caught on the ledge down there and that wasn't staged, that's you know, where, he, where he died. So people forget how brutal this was and how many people died in, in the wars. Lots of pretty life. Okay, Eye of Cuckoo. The Eye of Cuckoo is uh, the guy that founded Blue Lagoon, uh, Kimu, Kimu is Zeke, I think, um, was a child during the attack. And of course, they were occupied by the Japanese, and evidently the army officers and army people were pretty nasty to them. But the naval people were much more civilized. And one of the naval officers befriended him. I think he was maybe 12 or something like that. And actually became a friend and actually presented him with a sword, which is now in their little museum. Uh, in any case, his friend was on this ship. And uh, so it has, this, this ship has a, very important memory for him, who he's now passed away, but 730 men were lost. Basically, it took a bomb that hit the, well, they all had tons of ammunition, but it hit a major area of ammunition. The entire, I'm gonna have to look at my picture, I forget. Either bow or stern was completely disintegrated, just gone, and it sunk immediately. So there were no survivors. There it is, the bow was blown off. And I mean almost half the ship. It's a little bit deeper, 134 feet, the shallowest, 213 in the sand. It's a pretty dive, though. It's blue water, as you can see. The stern gun, notice there's not as much growth on that. Yep, another bathroom filled with silt. And this one had quite a few remains on it. And those, you know, those are human bones that are laying around. <coughs> We're getting close here. I wanted to put you all to sleep. It's pretty warm in here. Yeah, this one's 130 feet, or 128 shallowest, 167. The deepest dive that we did was 180 feet. Um, longest dive we did was an hour and a half underwater. Um, I'd say on average, everything combined, it was usually a little over an hour per dive, which is why I wore, wore doubles, because I'd have lots of air left over, and I'd rather have lots left over than be a little bit short, especially when you're doing decompressions. What I loved about this ship is, how many wrecks do you see a smokestack like that? It's still intact. <laughs> Oh, that's a, anybody know what a butterfly hatch is? We used to live on a sailboat, so we had a butterfly hatch. It's usually over the engine room on the big ships, and they lift them up to ventilate the room and down. That's what that, that was. Oops, I went past it. And China laying around, not staged. That I thought was cool. It's actually an anti-aircraft gun that's lower than the, the, the main deck, the stern deck. Which I never saw that before. Stern deck gun. Uh, 
And that's a, uh, an auxiliary helm on the stern. And finally, the San Francisco, which is definitely one of our favorites. And it's, it's a deeper wreck, 148 men, 207 to the very, very bottom. Which basically, you'd have to be inside of the keel line to get that deep. And one other thing that's cool about it is, I think that, oh, come on. There we go. Coming on the deck line. This one's on the bow of this, this rack. And notice how little growth there is on this, because it's a deeper wreck, it doesn't get as much light. Okay, there we go. And that's one of my favorite pictures. Well, this is cool. It's a uh, staff car. Now, right there, it doesn't look like a staff car, but here, it looks like a staff car. And aerial bombs, it's a little freaky, you know. There is so much live ammunition on these wrecks. It's pretty freaky. And these are uh, beach mines, land mines, hemispherical, and literally back in here, this is solid stack, that stack all around you were stacks of these things. This was about 180 feet uh, as far as the depth. And uh, yeah, there you see some more stack. And then also right next to them, you had that. Anybody know what that is? Cordite? Cordite's basically nitroglycerin. Strand, strings of nitro. That, it was, I think it was used as the propellant for shells. It's what would shoot the head of the shell. It's what went into the casing. And it was just everywhere in there. Shot of a bollard. And this is coming on the, San Francisco had three tanks on deck, two on one side. And this is the side that has only one. And People thought maybe there might have been a second one that fell off. It turns off what was on one side were two tanks, and the other side was one tank and one steamroller, which did fall off. It's down in the sand, it's the steamroller. So that's the one the single tank. These were three man tanks. And then on the other side, they almost went over. The one's literally sitting on top of the other. So when it sunk, they almost flipped over the side. I don't know if you can really see, but this is the bottom of one, and the other one's over here. Okay, and finally, uh, what they do when there's a group like us, they have a, a barbecue. So the, the different guides and that cook up fish and meat and, and have a big outdoor feast, big celebration. And this is the day before, well, okay, the next day was a non-dive day because the following day we flew. So this is the night they have the party. It's also when you tip them. And uh, they give you a little certificate, you know, basically saying you dove truck lagoon. And uh, we tend to over tip. We tip them exactly the same as what we tip mates here, which to them was literally more than a month's pay. I mean, the, our two guys were literally over the top. You know, they were like so thrilled, but my God, they, carry the gear, you do nothing. You don't even climb out of the boat with a tank on. You swim up to the boat, turn around, they pull the tanks off, lift them in, you climb up the ladder. You don't take the tanks off the boat to fill them. Little deer pops them on his bank, back, carries them ashore, they fill them, they bring them back. You show up the boat, it's all ready to go. Your regs are on perfectly. And these are the, Penny bought one dress and our friend uh, Terry bought the other and actually, this guy, Deer, who is our, the boat operator, literally climbed the wall because she was in the store and he was in the store at the same time and she wanted the dress up there and nobody could reach it. So he, she said he just climbed the wall, got it for her. And the locals were over the top because the two of them were wearing local attire. They just thought, to them that was beautiful, you know, compared to 
just normal attire. This was a, actually a sub-base during the war. And there's the walkway. That was built by the Japanese. And uh, there's one of the homes. And actually very sweet people. They, uh, the school let out while we were there. The kids were given a long-term recess. So the kids are following us around because we're strange looking. And uh, this was an area, I mean, that's it, no hassle, where they sold the stuff they made. And you get these beautiful handmade, I don't know what they're called, penny bolts, several for what, what $3, $4. You almost felt guilty because it was so inexpensive and stuff that would take hours to make. And uh, this was a school during the Japanese occupation, and it was the school that they used. I think, or, well, I don't know if it was still being used, but in any case, a typhoon that took place a year or two before we were there hit it, and that's why it's missing its roof and everything, so it's not being used. And that was a tunnel that was dug. This was a communications area, so there was a communication tower there, and they would go in here during bombings. You know, so it's, but it was muddy, it was nasty. And at the end of it, we went all the way in, and it was all collapsed down, you know, mud. This was unusual because it's, it was the hospital. And you think, why wouldn't anybody be living here? Because there's rooms and roof and part of it. And what's the word, bad juju, am I saying that right? Yeah. Basically, this is where the atrocities took place. The surgeon did experimental surgery uh, with some of her pilots. They practiced bayonet drills on the live pilots. They, time to a tree and the guys would bayonet them and bayonet them and bayonet them. And uh, very, very nasty stuff took place here. So it's, it, just walking through there, it gives you the creeps. You can see down the side there. And these were, this is right outside of the school that they have now. And these are bunkers. And the kids are climbing on top of the bunkers. They have them blocked off so they can't get inside. But it's, it's sort of interesting to see these cute young children. You know, the bunkers are their playground. And that's a school. The schools have no windows. When they got their independence, the US agreed that we would continue to protect them, aid them in national disaster, and provide help the schools. The schools have no books, no chalk, no tablets. That's how much we help them. They have nothing. The teacher stands up and teaches. So it's, it's a little sad. And each room is a separate grade. And to give the idea how isolated they are, I uh, have a little bit of time left, and I'll shut up. Uh, in fact, that's the very last slide. The, uh, our friend Karen is actually Associate Director of Engineering for NASA. She's up there. When we were there the first time, she had been there multiple times, but. The, their guide, and she was a rebreather person, was like the most experienced, knowledgeable person. And he read like crazy, and he was fascinated with space and outer space and NASA. So the next time we went back, she took a bunch of stickers and patches, NASA things. But he had retired. He wasn't there anymore. So the next most experienced guide they had, she gave him patches. And he said, what's NASA? He said, NASA stands for National Aeronautic Space Administration. We're the, you know, we do satellites in space and, and the space station, you know, in space. And he said, there's people in space? Had no idea. But no TV, no radio, no electricity, other than, well, I forgot to mention the place we stay has three generators. Every eight hours, one generator's running. So at the end of eight hours, power goes off for a couple minutes, and then it comes on again. They switch generators. They rotate through the th three generators. 
the airport is all solar panels. It's all solar power. So that's it. Any questions? Ready to eat? Thank you.